guys were white men from Southern Alberta. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really lovely people. Um, but I think like many Canadians, there's like so much unlearning and also learning that needs to be done on the part of mm -hmm. settlers. Um, and so I brought these crew members into my community um, and then witnessed things that were just not okay. Um, and knowing that I was um, the one leading this project, that I was the one responsible for bringing people who weren't from my community into my community to work with very vulnerable people. Um, and not just vulnerable people, but you know, the process of, of, of sharing your story on camera is a, a very vulnerable position to be in. Um, and so I wanted to use that moment as an opportunity to, um, to build a better way of working. Um, and it's, it's very complicated. I think, um, a lot of, uh, it's, it's so obvious. A lot of us within the BIPOC community are, um, carry the burden of having to do all of the emotional labor and just the labor of, of educating settlers on all mm -hmm. of the things they just don't know yet. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those things that I was bumping up against during development was that um, I was having to constantly teach my crew, like they were asking questions, just like throughout the day, so many questions, like, what about this? How did that, how does that happen? And um, how did it become this way? Um, questions that I just shouldn't have to be answering when I'm trying to direct a film that I've put so much time and energy into. Um, so it was a moment of, of, you know, trying to navigate through that and to figure out how we could move forward as a crew, how we could continue moving forward with this project in a way that, um, I don't know, just, just ensured that, that, each time we work together, we would, I wouldn't be dealing with, with that. And my community wouldn't be dealing with that burden as well. Um, and that I was, you know, keeping my community safe. Um, and so we, uh, we did mandatory cultural competency training. <laughs> um, uh, and I wish we'd done anti-racism training as well. I think that's like so necessary. Um, mm -hmm. but we did three days of that. It was, um, it was a mandatory process for, for my non-Indigenous crew. Mm. Um, and you certainly can't, uh, you know, come to understand everything you need to understand within three days. Um, but I think it, it set a tone of, um, of respect and understanding um, for them as settlers to know that, you know, they, there's a lot that they don't know and mm. um, that working with um, indigenous communities is a, a privilege it's not a right mm. um, and to understand you know their their position in all of this um, so that that worked to a degree I think it was really a really great way of working um, and another thing that we we did with this project that I think um, has been really unique um, is that uh, Early on in our development shooting, a group of women from my community, all working in health, um, came out to Vancouver to the downtown east side to learn about harm reduction and to learn about, um, uh, you know, radical approaches to, to treating addiction. Um, and we were filming all of this. And my mom said to me, like, this is so great. We're learning so much. Is there a way that we can share this footage with the community like right away because she knows you know how long it takes to make uh, a film especially a feature film um and and immediately I was like yeah that's actually a really great idea like this doesn't have to be uh a, you know this isn't just about making this feature film that we'll share with audiences it's about um engaging with community and ensuring that my community benefits from this film first and foremost because it's our stories and mm. um, it's our experience um, and so what we did is we created uh, seven short films based on this time um, and all of the the knowledge that was gained here in Vancouver um, and we used those seven films um, over the last three years within the community to to share knowledge to to start conversations to kind of like get the ball rolling on on open dialogue and um, and it was a really interesting process. So you'll see whenever the film is finished, I don't know when we're going to finish it given this pandemic. Um, 
there's moments in the film where you see myself or my mother, um, people within the community showing these short films and, and witnessing these opportunities for community dialogue. Um, and so that was a really incredible experience just in terms of being able to um, just change the way that we work. Um, I think that is kind of like a, a fundamental thing that needs to happen within the industry is, is to recognize that we don't have to work a certain way um, and that if we're coming from a place of responsibility and respect and also a place of love, um, I think that we can, we can, you know, change everything about the way that we work because it, it, the, the industry now, the structures that exist can, are in many ways so toxic. <clears throat> um, and yeah, so that's, that's where we're at with, with that particular documentary. And, um, and it's, it's been a real learning process. And now that we're in the edit, um, it's also like all of those questions about, you know, how, how can I tell this story in a way that does not damage or do harm to my community? Mm. How can I, um, how can I ensure that um, when I'm placing this story on the screen through the edit, how can I ensure that I'm just not like replicating um, the same sort of documentary narratives that we see about indigenous people on screen, especially regarding addiction. Um, yeah, it's, it's still <laughs> a, a work in progress. Um, and so while I've been working on that, we also shot The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open. Um, and so I was able to kind of take some of those lessons that I'd gained from working on the documentary into our process on The Body Remembers. Um, and uh, it was a really incredible experience. Um, so my co-writer and my co-director, Kathleen Hepburn, uh, she's a settler, Canadian, um, and I've known her for, for quite a few years and have just like really, really admired her work and who she is as a person. Um, and I just love the way that she, she tells stories. Um, and so I knew that working with Kathleen would be, would be an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was also an interesting way to, to collaborate, um, you know, as an indigenous filmmaker with the, with a settler filmmaker and find ways of working that, um, were community based and focused on, again, building capacity in the industry and changing the way that we work, um, and finding a process that, um, didn't replicate these extractive forms of, of filmmaking. Um, so from the get-go, Kathleen and I recognized that um, for, those of, for those people who haven't seen The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open, um, it's about two Indigenous women. Um, one uh, is a young woman who's just aged out of foster care. She's pregnant and she's uh, fleeing her partner who uh, who's, who's violent. Um, and then the other is this sort of privileged indigenous woman. She benefits from light skin privilege. She's middle class. Um, and she essentially helps this other, this young woman who's, who's fled, uh, this abusive situation. Mm. Um, and so from the get go, Kathleen and I recognized that, um, the character of Rosie, this young woman who has aged out of foster care, um, that neither of us has had that lived experience, that neither of us can possibly understand what it, what it is like to grow up in that way. Um, and that we had a responsibility to ensure that, that we were um, doing her, her story justice. Um, and so we held this workshop with young indigenous women who had aged out of foster care um, and, uh, did a script workshop with them for a couple of days. Um, and it was such an incredible experience um, to be able to sit down with them, for them to go through, go through the script with us and, and really be honest about the ways that maybe we screwed up or um, assumptions that we had made about them and their experiences. Um, and I, yeah, I think that moment was, was, um, so incredibly important to to our process was to work with these young women who had aged out of foster care and and really um, created a space where 
where we were able to have open and honest dialogue about it. Um, and then the next thing that we, we considered um, was, again, building capacity. So making sure that we are um, building a sustainable future wherein um, Indigenous people can, can fill these key technical positions behind the camera. Again, going back to that idea of narrative sovereignty and, and having um, control uh, over and autonomy over our own, our own narratives and stories. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had the same issue. There weren't enough Indigenous people to work in those key technical positions here in Vancouver mm. at that time. Um, and so we built this uh, Indigenous Youth Mentorship Project. Um, mm. uh, TELUS was uh, kind enough to give, us a, to give us a grant where we were able to hire 11 Indigenous young people all working in film um, in these key departments. Um, and again, they worked in uh, a really close collaborative way with the head of each department. Um, and it wasn't like your standard kind of like trainee position. It was it was meant to be more than that. We wanted them to build a relationship um, where open and honest dialogue could happen. Mm. Um, and also just having these young people on set, I think really set a tone of responsibility um, mm. and accountability for all of us, like to recognize that um, the story that we're telling on screen is one that will ultimately directly impact these young people who are working on our crew. Mm. Um, and then we also did the, the mandatory cultural competency training for our, our entire crew, which was, um, uh, <laughs> our crew was not happy about it because we did it in the last day of prep. Um, oh. <laughs> so people were, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. people were just like, you know, desperately trying to take care of everything they needed to take care of before we go into produ- went into production the next week. Um, and so they were like, what? You're like making us sit down and like we have to learn something. Um, <laughs> but uh, we brought in um, a, a woman named Sarah Robinson. Um, she, runs, uh, she runs an Indigenous advising company called Rainwatch Advising. And Sarah is, uh, she's a law student at UVic, but she's worked um, in government for a long time. Um, and Sarah came in and she did this incredible uh, I would say it's like a, an Indigenous history uh, training workshop for our whole crew. Um, and, and then she also, um, she also just talked more broadly about violence against women and, and mm-hmm. shared, um, shared knowledge that I think a lot of people on our crew weren't necessarily aware of or maybe hadn't really taken in yet. Um, so by the end of that workshop, um, it, there was a sort of this profound feeling of like understanding um, and respect um, and maybe responsibility um, for the, the path that we had ahead of us. Um, there were a lot of tears shed, which doesn't normally happen um, for those reasons before starting a film. Um, so that was, that was a really incredible experience. And I think it's something I'm going to continue doing with all of my films um, about indigenous, uh, you know, indigenous stories, um, especially when working with with settler crew members. Um, And one other thing that we did that was a little bit different with this film was that we we found Violet Nelson um, to star in the film and Violet had never worked in film before, she'd never acted. Um, we we went to, through this open casting call process. So we initially um, went and saw conventional actors through you know a casting director. We did the the standard casting process, um, and we saw so many amazing um, auditions. But we didn't we didn't find someone who had that sort of like um, raw vulnerability that we were looking for Mm. um and so we decided to open it up more broadly especially knowing that um access to to working in film um is is not always uh like there's so many barriers to working in film for marginalized communities especially indigenous people like navigating the path to becoming an actor navigating the path to 
to working in the industry as a, a technician is, is really challenging when you're coming from a marginalized community. Um, so we knew that like there have to be some really talented, um, you know, first time actors out there. So why don't we just go in and look, um, look for someone. And we we're also inspired by other filmmakers who, who'd worked with uh, first time actors before, like mainly and Andrea Arnold. Um, yeah. <laughs> Fish Tank. And, I thought of that, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And American Honey. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. She, she managed to get some really beautiful performances out of, out of her actors. Um, and so we found Violet through this open casting call and she did such like we the moment we saw her we knew that that she was the one there was just something special about her hmm. um and violet talks about this um very openly that she she's uh her lived experience is quite similar to rosie's she uh was in foster care for a little while um and she witnessed her mother um go through a, a uh, an abusive relationship. Her mother's fine now and everything's fine. Um, but she, she experienced, uh, she experienced some of that. Um, and so Kathleen and I wanted to ensure that we, um, did in, you know, in no way harmed Violet or re-traumatized Violet in mm -hmm. the process because it's, you know, it's a lot to ask of anyone to tell that kind of, uh, story on screen, but especially someone who, um, has had lived experience that is very similar to, to what she's, she's depicting on screen. Um, and so this sounds like really out there, but um, Kathleen and I went and saw um, a therapist <laughs> um, to, to figure out um, uh, how to engage with trauma-informed practices in our rehearsal time um, and also when we went to camera. So um, uh, we shot the body remembers when the world broke open in one continuous take um, once a day for five days. Um, and one of the reasons we did that was to uh, kind of implement this process of, of theater. Um, and so in theater, you rehearse for weeks and weeks and weeks before ever going to the stage. Um, and there's, there's um, this really beautiful momentum that builds when there's this like po possibility for failure. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like, you're like trying your hardest just to like stay focused and, um, and a lot of beautiful moments can, can come out of that. Um, and so we wanted to have that opportunity with Violet to be able to rehearse as though, you know, it's, it's theater and um, we have to know the entire, all the dialogue the day we go to, to camera. Um, and also because uh, film is generally shot out of chronological order based on um, location availability and all of those kinds of, you know, random scheduling things. Mm -hmm. um, and so we didn't want to throw Violet into this situation where she would have to um, uh, essentially like uh, give this performance that's like all out of chronological order and, and, um, that's challenging enough for a veteran actor, let alone someone who had never acted before. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, so that's why we did the whole continuous take thing. Um, but anyway, Kathleen and I went and saw a therapist um, together. Like we sat on, <laughs> on the therapist couch um, and he helped us uh, develop trauma informed practices, things that we could look for, things that we could, um, think about tools that we could use in the rehearsal process to make sure that we were continuously um, taking care of Violet um, mm -hmm. because she was, you know, she, she carried the heart of that film and it was so important to take care of her, yeah. um, especially because she's a young Indigenous woman. Um, we just, we wanted to make sure that, um, that we were just doing our best to, 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 to make this film with love and respect for everyone. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think I've actually gone and rambled for like 40 minutes now. <laughs> so it went by I really quick though. 20? Uh, it, yeah, it went by super quick. Um, um are there any yeah. like questions or do you have questions? Cause I'm like, I'm sick of hearing my voice and I'm sick of hearing feel, you say, um, <laughs> I feel like you've covered a lot of ground though, like in terms of your process and just like a window into responsible filmmaking. <laughs> I feel like it should be. 
almost like a template. Um, even just the, the cultural competency training, it sounds like something that, because I have kids in school right now, or not in school, but like they're students, you know, um, elementary and soon to be high school. And I feel like if only we had that, that have that mentality, even just like with general education, you know, because I think so many things could be avoided if you have that kind of education from the get-go and just with filmmakers in general. Like, I'm sure the filmmakers who worked on your film, I don't think any of them regret having done that, even though it was, it felt like homework, I guess, to some of them at the time that they didn't need. But I'm sure now, especially, that they must be feeling, like, the benefits of it somehow. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was, uh, yeah. you know, having been on a lot of, like, you know, bigger sort of mainstream type sets it's just like a completely different environment when you know you have hundreds of people that you don't know uh walking all over <laughs> set and people don't like actually engage with one another and there's kind of just this like culture of um not disrespect but maybe like in some ways like um apathy towards the responsibility of telling stories if that makes sense mm. Yeah. I actually see a question from David Palmer. Can you see that one? Or what insights only... can you share about Indigenous audiences out of US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand? Um, I'm, what is that? I'm, what insights can you <laughs> <laughs> David, a little broad. Can you, can you expand on the question? <laughs> maybe the connection? Like, maybe, do you feel like there's some kind of through line perhaps i don't i don't know um yeah like with I think, maybe portrayals oh, i don't i don't know or film? maybe well <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, about oh, your okay. film the body All right. uh yeah sure i mean we've we've received um so much positive um feedback about the body remembers uh, when the world broke open from indigenous audiences um it's been a really incredible experience uh Maybe that's something I didn't talk about enough was um, was audience and, and considering who the story is for. Um, so with The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open, um, our intention from the get-go was to make this film for Indigenous women and for Indigenous youth um, and to, to ensure that Indigenous women and youth recognize and feel that their, their stories matter and belong on screen. Um, and so... Yeah, the the feedback that we've received um, has been really, really profound and beautiful. Um, and I think that's been the most kind of, uh, yeah, one of the most important important parts of, of making this film was, was knowing that the audience who we intended uh, it for, mm. I'm not even making sense, would, would yeah, they love, they, they like the film. <laughs> no, but, the, but like the who that you're depicting... Like, that's who you were making it for, essentially. Yeah, like, yeah. That's what, I think that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and that also impacted, like, the decisions we made in terms of uh, how we wrote the story and uh, who was in front of the camera and in which moment. Um, there's a question from Pete. Uh, at your next large, large production, would change the schedule of the cultural competency training? To your next large production, would you change the schedule? Um, yeah, I think it would be earlier on in the process, probably. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, every every film is different, um, and I think the process is going to be different for every film, and that's something that I've certainly taken away from these um, last two projects is that um, the process is really what you make it, and. There isn't one way to make a film uh, and there isn't one way to engage with a story um, and there isn't one way to engage with an audience. So, yeah, I guess it just depends on, on uh, yeah, the project. Um, oh, OK. It looks like there's another part to the question from David. I think he's talking about not so non-Indigenous or non-informed people, audiences. I do not know what context. Oh, um, yeah, uh, 
there's certainly been people who um, know nothing. Like we, we premiered the film in Berlin, uh, premiered at the Berlinale in 2019, last year. Um, and, you know, this is a story about two indigenous women in East Vancouver. Um, and we were kind of like, how are Germans or an international audience even going to respond to this film? There are so many, um, you know, specific nuances to the lived experience of these two women um, and two indigenous people in general in, uh, in North America. And um, uh, what we found was that this story in a lot of ways is very universal, which is quite heartbreaking. Um, it just mm -hmm. goes to show how pervasive um, intimate partner violence is mm -hmm. and um, how uh, structural inequalities, um, lack of support and services for, for women who are fleeing these situations, how that is a, also pervasive like globally. Um, so yeah, that was a really incredible experience for us to, to find that international audiences like understood this film and that it resonated with them on a personal level, despite it being um, such a specific nuanced story. It's extremely nuanced. I actually, you must've been aware on some level that what you were doing was, was so special in a way because you have two indigenous women as the main characters, like, and it's, it's really centered on their dynamic, which, which keeps changing throughout the film. And yeah, it, um, yeah. It, it, well, if the film was, you know, it's, it was meant to be a story that I had never seen on screen before. Um, so it was inspired by an experience that I had um, in the same neighborhood where we shot the film. Um, and very much like in the film, I encountered a young indigenous woman who uh, had just fled her abusive partner. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up taking her home with me like Isla did with Rosie. Um, and I thought that I had the capacity or the skills to help her or to solve her problems and very quickly realized how naive I was, especially in my privilege. Um, so this experience was like a deep confrontation of my own privilege and also just um, a moment to recognize how my own preconceived notions about a, a young woman like her um, really influenced my understanding or lack of understanding of her reality. And so um, the film is a way to honor that experience, to, to place the complexities of, of you know, the intersections of class and even race within the indigenous experience um, and also the urban indigenous exper experience, to be able to place that on screen and to do so in a way that, you know, I'd never seen before was, um, was a really incredible opportunity. And so, yeah, so I think we did know that this was something special in that sense. Um, but yeah, it was an absolute honor and a privilege to be able to make that film. And I'm so glad that audiences are able to see it um, because that is such a, a barrier for indigenous filmmakers is, is um, uh, distribution and the dissemination of our work and you know lack of access for, for audiences to, to independent films, especially films made by indigenous people. So um, hmm. I feel so privileged that um, that our film has received the distribution that it has and that people are able to see it. Um, I, I think we have another one from Pete. I think he wants to, okay, so he feels like there are uh, com complex issues which cannot be combined into your 90 minute film. Was there any aspect you wish you had more screen time with, I guess, or for, I should say? Uh, good question. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, 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 because it's such a complex story, because, you know, there's so much um, to pack into that 90 minutes, we recognize that, like, ultimately it was about honoring that short encounter between these two women, keeping it contained within that experience um, would be enough. Um, and it's, it's also like, you know, we made this for Indigenous women and for Indigenous youth. So in considering them as our audience first and foremost, um, it was liberating in the sense that we 
didn't have to explain everything because it's like when you're um, creating something for a specific audience, you know that they're going to come at it with with um, knowledge and lived experience that mm -hmm. others might not. Um, and so that was a really liberating and beautiful feeling to know that we didn't have to explain everything because we were making it for for people who already are coming at it with that lived experience. Um, I don't think we have any, well, I remember when I collected questions on the IG stories, I did get one question, uh, which was semi, yeah, pretty relevant, I guess, um, about funding for a feature, a feature film. Um, I believe this person is working in Canada. I don't know this person personally, but maybe just some like really quick, quick tips. I mean, we're, we're going to be cut off soonish, but, um, maybe just like one um, or two things you learned. <laughs> I don't, I know it's a complex question, but. I think uh, we're in a really interesting moment in Canada in terms of um, the activism and advocacy that's happened from, uh, from within the BIPOC film community um, and coming at it as an indigenous filmmaker. There's so many people who have um, laid, uh, laid the groundwork for people like me to, to be able to access necessary funding. Um, so I think major uh, funding institutions in Canada are now having to recognize that they need to be accountable um, and that their values need to align with their actions. Um, and so I think now is the time to, to for, for BIPOC filmmakers, for filmmakers from marginalized communities um, to to, to access the funding that is now available. Obviously, we're, there isn't enough. We're still having to like fight for a little piece of the pie. There's still major disparities in terms of access to those funds. Um, but really, uh, you know, just find producers who, who you can trust, find producers who know how to navigate the really complex Canadian funding system. Um, and um, yeah, find producers who uh, respect and understand your creative vision. Um, and in building that relationship, I think it makes it so much easier to, to you know, do the necessary like step-by-step -step process of applying for funds. And, and that's all it is really, is just you know, taking it step-by-step. And, and putting in the work of like all of those applications because you don't, you know, there's a lot of rejection in terms of, in terms of funding applications. Um, and then in terms of distribution, like for us, we received so many um, <laughs> rejections. Uh, a lot of people weren't interested in distributing this film. Um, and then mm -hmm. out of left field came Ava DuVernay and Array. Mm -hmm. Um, and that changed everything for this film. So I think if you just, you know, stay committed to your vision and honor your, you know, your intentions and know that you're, you know, as long as you're working from a place of like love and respect um, and commitment, then, you know, you'll, you'll find what you need to, to get this, to get your film made. Thank you. That was great. Uh, that was a great, very efficient um, answer to the question. I don't think we have any more questions for now. And I actually don't want us uh, to get cut off, especially you. So I'm not going to say anything other than just thank you again for doing this. And thank you to everyone for, for watching um, and sharing and just like for the interest and curiosity um, to learn. Uh, I'm going to let you actually have the last word. <laughs> uh, um, thank you. Yeah, it was, it was great. Thanks for listening to me ramble for a really long time. Sorry if I repeated myself. Um, yeah, it, and yeah, um, that's all I have to say. Thanks. <laughs> I actually think I speak for everyone when I, I say that we could listen to you for days. So Aww. that was very informative. <laughs> it was, it was really like just, yeah, very informative. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So all I'll right. just end it here. So we don't have that really abrupt cutoff. Uh, thanks to everybody. Awesome. Uh, and Take care, stay safe. Um, I know we've been hearing that a lot, but you know, it needs to be, uh, I think said and take care of each other. Yeah. And uh, be kind if you can and, and learn. I mean, not you specifically, I guess I'm talking to like people more generally. Um, yeah. 
yeah, learn what you can and listen if you can too. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so cool. much. All right. Thank you. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Bye. Okay.